Good. Hi, everybody. I'm Darren Nakuda. I'm the founder and CTO of Mighty AI. And um, thanks for being here. We've had some really cool talks today about all aspects of self-driving cars. And like Alexi said, we focus on one particular angle of that, which is building training data. And on the AI side, we've been building training data across a variety of different verticals, but this is definitely one of the most exciting ones. So for us, when we talk about all the different ways that you can collect data and all the different sensors that are out there, the big question is, what do you do with that? Because raw data doesn't do anybody any good. So how do you get into a usable state? And uh, before I dive into exactly what we do in the driving space, let me just tell you a little bit more about our company and give you a little context for the role that we play. So we like to call our platform Training Data as a Service. And we started about two and a half years ago. Um, myself and three co-founders started this company in Seattle. We've raised about $27 million to date, including most recently from Intel Capital, Google Ventures, and Accenture. And really what we do is help companies usually take the data they already have, but annotate it and get it in a state where they can trust it so they can use it to train and scale their computer vision and natural language models. As you can see, there's several components to what training data as a service means. And that's starting with having the raw content. Sometimes we help uh, collect that as well. But the next step is task creation, which is where we've spent a lot of time building dedicated UIs to perform different tasks. So you've seen examples of drawing bounding boxes or categorization or freeform text entry, all the way through some of the stuff I'll show you today around semantic segmentation of images and a lot more advanced tooling. With other platforms, often you have to build those, those things yourself. It's a lot of work, and especially a lot of iteration to get it right based on how your community performs. The next step of pre-qualifying users is really you know, what you would consider the typical crowdsourcing model. We have a community of folks. The big difference is we know a lot about them. So starting out on day one, we launched on iOS only on mobile devices. We required Facebook Connect, and we allow them to connect their profile to Google, to, um, to their uh, PayPal, and basic in their LinkedIn. And using that profile of who the person is, we figure out you know, what are they likely to be able to perform well on. For example, in a retail task, you may want your target customer to be the ones doing your annotation so they use the right words and the right language. Um, beyond how they identify and how they answer surveys, there's definitely a level of qualification to make sure they're also aligned with what you want. So we work with our customers to define what, you know, what are the goals or what are some of the gold standards that you're looking for in the data you're collecting and make sure that the people are aligned, that they can follow the instructions, that they know how to use the tools. So if, if it's a requirement that they can draw bounding boxes, we make sure that we test them and make sure they can do that. From there, the task distribution step is where we decide who of that community are the right people to do a task. And, and we push that to them. So whether they're on desktop or on their mobile device, we'll send them a notification saying there's available task. And the next step, task get done. It's the magic step. So that, you know, this is where we pay individuals to do tasks on our platform. And we, obviously, with any system where you're paying people, there's, there's fraud. There's getting to know new people and see kind of calibrating them against others. And that's what the loop with quality insurance is about. So we have our own internal models on user reputation and data quality so that we can assess the likelihood that an answer is correct, even if we don't have a correct answer. And from there, what, what comes out of the whole system is label data. So that is what would be ready to be um, used as training data into a system. There's an additional loop that can happen after that, which is obviously validation of the model. So once we take that data and give it to a to a customer to, build, to test their model, they can come back with, here's what our model is returning. Um, is it correct? And we can use humans to do that as well. Um, so part of you know, why we started this was that each of the founders had used crowdsourcing a lot in the past. I worked at Amazon. I also worked at a bunch of startups that were, were using a variety of internal resources, crowdsourcing, external vendors, trying to figure out how do we annotate data and collect data. And you know, what we learned is that it's really hard to scale an internal team. So getting a few interns to do some number of labels, that's pretty easy. When, when that scale ex explodes or you need you know, more spiky traffic, it, think of it as you know, the uh, AWS was for computing. Rather than having a fixed workforce, you can have a scaling workforce. Um, one of the startups I built was called Teach Street. 
and we were structuring uh, learning systems in, uh, in Seattle, and then we launched another market. So we were finding all the yoga teachers, all the musicians, all the tutors, categorizing their content, um, uh, parsing their schedules, and making a structured catalog. And we did it with people in our office, really you know, manually looking at listings, crawling the web. And it, it worked great for one market, but there was no way we could go to eight markets and then nationally with, without um, a little bit more help. So we went to crowdsourcing. We used um, the big platform from the big company in Seattle. And they, um, you know, it was a lot of learning. It, we spent a lot of time figuring out what are the right instructions, how do we do QA, how do we understand fraud, and, and basically how much do we pay, how many people do we ask. And that was a full-time job. And, we, and it's still a lot of problems. And every person I talked to who was also using the same platform had the same experience. So I thought, rather than have everybody have to relearn the same lessons over and over again, let's start a new company, abstract some of those concepts, and kind of let them focus on what they do and take care of the data for them. So this is just a list of some of the customers we work with. They are mainly large enterprises, but they span a lot of industries from automotive and retail, healthcare, travel. And we, we do a variety of um, AI. We support a lot of vari a variety of AIs from computer vision to natural language. So now that you have the context, let's talk about driving. Um, there are several public data sets that we use as references when we first got started, and they were a good place to start. So a lot of you have probably seen Cityscapes, Kitty, and some of the research and data sets coming out of Coco. Um, they are super valuable for evaluating kind of what, what's possible, but they're small, you know, they're general purpose, there's licensing issues when you come to wanting to use it commercially. And this is my one joke of the day, so everybody's ready. Um, they don't really get you where you want to go. Okay. I didn't think it was going to work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, most of our customers have really specialized requirements, specific locations, definitions of the types of objects they want to classify. That's actually proprietary to a lot of them is kind of what, what they want to label and why and they need a lot more data than the open data sets. You know, some of the differences could be location-based, so the roads, the road markings, even the types of vehicles you see in Europe or Asia are gonna be a lot different than what you see on the streets around here. And, um, and same thing with weather and driving behaviors as far as school buses, stop and go traffic, delivery vehicles. And so really that's why most of our customers are investing in building their own data sets that they can use. So you know, here are some sample images that came from our own data collection of some of the different scenarios that we deal with. Um, the first one is obviously it's a street with mar road markings, traffic signs, traffic, construction, um, snow, which as we've heard multiple times is a, is a really hard challenge. Um, a parked construction vehicle, and then obviously low light, snow on the non-drivable surface, but it's on the sidewalk. So it's probably good to know it's there. It's an emergency exit, but it's not the common driving platform. And these are the types of things that we, we may label. So as we came to think about this, we, you know, we first naively approached the problem like any other computer vision problem that we've helped annotate. And we used our current tools. And we, we built, um, we used our, basically our object annotation tool to label images, and the punchline is it failed spectacularly. Um, found it was really hard to outline overlapping objects, get 100% precision, and it was just very time consuming. You can see the, the laundry list of the types of things that were trying to be labeled. It was just really hard to use. So we went back to the drawing board, and we built a new annotation tool. This one taking some of the ideas around segmentation and doing true segmentation, so sharing lines, having common edges, and this actually failed as well. It was a lot better, but uh, annotating a single image would take a really long time for any one individual. It was hard for to make sure they got all of this, uh, the details in the instructions because the rules about annotating the, a vehicle versus snow or uh, a tree were all different in how to handle groups of individuals like the, the folks on the left in that photo versus two individuals are split up. Like if you can drive your car between them, it's you know, probably want to have them two, as two individual images, so we know that. If, if there are a cluster of people, that's definitely, you know, important to know as well. And that goes into occlusion of partially visible objects and knowing where the, where the other side that you can't quite see in this still image 
might, might be and which direction it might be moving. So there's a lot of confusion around this. So we went back to what we do best, which is breaking task into micro task. And rather than doing everything at once, we broke it into logical groupings. So in this case, we had folks annotate every car in the image, just vehicles. Um, um, so, and then we did a separate task for the same image where it was just the road, road markings, or just the road surfaces. And we tried to make sure the community was educated around the definition and the requirements of each one. So as you can imagine, that was a lot of, a lot of requirements, a lot of reading, a lot of calibrating of folks to, to get you know, the right rules for each object. But in the end, it, it actually helped a lot. You know, the biggest challenge we had with this approach was around recall. So making sure every single car or every single pedestrian or every single road marking in the image was marked. Um, because doing it as a whole, if most of these cars were marked but two weren't, and then we said, well, now we have to go back and remark the entire image to make sure it's usable. Otherwise, it's, might as well throw it away. So we went back one more time and we broke it up into even more micro task. And so in this, um, we call this recursion, we'd actually annotate each, um, each car one by one. So we'd say, don't worry about the whole image. Are there any cars in this image that have not yet been annotated? And if there are, um, draw, draw a mask around it. And so here you can see an animation of kind of how the drawing process works over time. So the different colors are the different classes of buildings and vehicles, uh, riders and vehicles, and road markings. And each, each one of those shapes was drawn by a, a different individual, and they were all aggregated together to end up with a, what I think is a pretty high quality result. Um, and you know, one of the biggest problems with it is it still took a lot of time. Every single drawing, every single you know, one pixel accurate marking around a vehicle was something that was being done by hand by tapping on, on, a, on the mouse or by tapping on our touch interface on mobile. So the next step of what we've been doing is we've been working on using our own computer vision models to pre-segment the images. So in this case, we're looking, we're using an, an algorithm that we developed to find shapes. And if you can see the yellow lines, those are all super pixels. And we now change the task from having to draw these fine lines to just labeling them. So it's kind of a paint by numbers style approach. So somebody can just drag their finger or their mouse over the different areas and say, this, everything in the, in the lower area is a road. There's road markings, there's vehicles. And, and the lines are, are by definition crisp. So using this along with our underlying models that I talked about earlier around user reputation and targeting and assessment, it's made it really, it, like made us uniquely able to, um, to do this at scale and do this at a reasonable cost. So looking ahead, I mean, you've seen these pictures throughout the day. You've heard tons about different types of sensors. Right now in driving, we've primarily talked about uh, photos and in, in, uh, camera images. But obviously, there are other sensors out there. there. There's a big one we've talked about all day, which is LiDAR. And um, those are definitely on, you know, on, our ra on our radar. Another joke. Um, <laughs> and you know, definitely. Um, something we're looking at. So you know, it's, it's all on our future roadmap, and I can't dive too deep into it, but that's definitely top of mind. And um, yeah, so, so that was a lot, and um, tried to rush through it for you guys. So um, as far as what's next, my recommendation is as you think about what kinds of data you need, obviously you're going to collect a lot of it. You have to figure out how you're going to store it, figure out what you're going to do with it. So, as you can see, it's really difficult, even with photographic images, to get the right level of quality and the right level of detail that you want. It takes a lot of time. It's probably not what you want to be doing. Um, without being a sales pitch, we're really good at doing it. And, uh, and you know, I think it can give you a lot of time back to doing the actual research, building the models, validating them, and then, and then um, having a, a great closed loop. So if you're interested in talking more, I'm, I'm around. We can talk more. Um, I guess I wrapped up early, so we have time for a couple questions. Hello. Um, so that was a really interesting talk. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, we've been talking a little bit about trust um, of AI, specifically users trusting AI. 
And I thought there was a really interesting parallel between that and your user reputation algorithm. Would you mind giving a little bit more detail into how you go about calculating how much you trust a user? Uh, sure. I, so I have to stay pretty high level on some of the reputation stuff, because that's kind of our secret sauce. But the, um, the net of it is looking at both their ability to do particular types of tasks and how, many, you know, how they've done them over time. And, and calibrating that with other people doing tasks, known answers, and, and overall, you know, our own QA of the data and the customer's QA, so we have feedback loops. And um, ultimately, when data comes into our system for validation, it doesn't really matter whether it comes from another human or whether it comes from a system, the, the task is the same. So your question of trust and whether something is good, it's, the source is independent of whether or not the data is good. To maybe one more question, anybody have a question? Uh, let's see. Yeah. So we're gonna take a few minutes here to get it set up for a panel. So um, last break of the day, talking about our dinners upstairs, and uh, we'll be back in a little bit. Thank you. Thanks.